The Artists in Residence program in Everglades National Park, known as ARI, is a nonprofit organization originally founded in 2001 when the $8 billion Everglades Restoration Bill was passed by the U.S. Congress. Our mission is to inform, connect, and support artists, writers, curators, and musicians by providing month-long residencies in the Everglades National Park, known for its rich wildlife, particularly large wading birds, and noted as the only place in the world where both alligators and crocodiles coexist. The Greater Everglades Watershed Region, starting in Central Florida and ending in Florida Bay, is an imperiled ecosystem due to numerous problems, primarily water management and habitat loss. ARI creates opportunities for artists to increase environmental awareness through outreach events and exhibitions, and was inspired by the risk-taking work of Robert Chambers, who is best known for his large-scale sculptures and installations which bring together whimsy and humor with scientific, mechanical, and industrial acumen. Chambers grew up immersed in scientific inquiry as the son of a cellular molecular physiologist and a metalworks sculptor. With Aries' support of an Artworks grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, or NEA, he created a new body of work combining elements such as biomimicry, 3D printing, and principles of evolutionary biology to express the urgency of conserving the delicate relationships of natural phenomena and indigenous species that make up the Florida Everglades. After standing in the scrub brush, being surrounded by pines and beautiful sounds of birds and cricket frogs, I was thinking what could be realized with the Saranoa Ripens. One thing that happened was I was thinking about a portmanteau of Saranoa and Ripens, which has to do with creeping and crawling like a snake or a serpent. And the name of the project became Serpents. We organized opportunities for Chambers to interact with several local environmental groups, but it was the extremely impressive research team at Archbold Biological Station, which ultimately captivated his imagination with information about the remarkable tenacity of the saw palmetto, or Saranoa repens, which can live upwards of 5,000 years, thanks to its expansive clonal root system and adaptability to fire and water. I was thinking of ways to educate the public, to become excited about a fairly quiet looking poem. But at the Archbald camp is where it all came together when Hilary Swain was talking about this unusual plant, its ecology, the connections of the scientists who have been studying hydrology in the area, the, hidden, the entomologists, the naturalists, and it all came together. But I was at the top and the bottom, the head and the tail of the Everglades River of Grass. I started working with the uh, people from the RDF lab, robotics design and uh, fabrication labs. I also started going to the Embis labs. Once I had an idea of what I wanted to do, which was the Saranoa Ripens project, I thought of how I would communicate to the public the necessity or the need for bringing back this plant or to create awareness about it. So I was thinking about MakerBots and PLA, which is a cellulose sugar-based compound that can 3D print forms. Then I was thinking about 3D printing the tiny quarter inch long micro wasp, one of the super pollinators of the inflorescence, the flower mass of this amazing plant, which is the only, it's the only one of its genus, Saranoa ripens. So I wanted to supersize the insect to create an allure, to make you think about the paddle leg bits that would help pollinate the stamen and the pistil. For this exhibition, Chambers stylized models of this root system and pollinators supported by videos, drawings, graphs, and specimens on loan from the South Florida Collections Management Center. The giant insects and berries are made of polylactic acid, a non-toxic filament resin made of sugar derived from starches found in foods. This CNC machine, which is making tables, which will be educational platforms milled with shapes done on this Techno 4896 CNC 
robotic table that would be using fusion programs. These uh, table forms that would have these milled tops with insects, with Cerano ripen shapes, with oolitic limestone forms and keystone forms, which is what is under the Cerano ripens in the dry areas in most of Florida. I thought of how to communicate to the public with all these objects made in a new art form, a new way of communicating science and art would be these 3D printers. So I went out of my safe zone. Since I'm a trained sculptor, I'm now in a new medium. I'm in a whole new place that could go anywhere. Through the conduit of contemporary art, through the conduit of art. The Cerno Ripens project is to cause people to want to reseed and to re create a new habitat in the tundra. While visiting this innovative exhibition, Merging Art and Science in the Ariness Gallery, one can see saw palmettos growing right outside of the window while learning about the plant and the importance of preserving biodiversity in the Florida Everglades. Through the conduit of contemporary art, this whole impressive process is an effort to popularize ecological research to create environmental awareness of our rapidly changing planet. Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sarah Michelle Rupert. I'm the Interim Executive Director of ARI. And I, um, I'm going to say just a few things uh, before we get our panel kicked off today. Uh, first, I wanted to thank the Perez Art Museum Miami and the amazing staff here for hosting us today for this discussion. I also wanted to thank some of our sponsors. We heard a little bit about the NEA, who sponsored the Robert Chambers Solo Show. We also would like to thank the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, the Knight Foundation for all of their support, and the Miami-Dade Department of Cultural Affairs, um, without which our programming, our projects wouldn't be possible. I also wanted to recognize, I see some of our board members here. I wanted to say hi and thank you. If you could raise your hand and give us all a wave. Thank you so much for joining us. And also I see a few of our past Aerie Fellows in the audience. If we could also give a, a hand and a applause for them. We've got quite a few of them here. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to be hearing a, a bit more about ARI, and I think a lot of you are already pretty familiar with our organization. For those of you that are not, um, we are a nonprofit organization. We um, manage a artist residency in the Everglades National Park, working with the park as our official partner to host multidisciplinary artists in the Everglades for a month at a time. <clears throat> we work with our artists, introducing them to scientists, biologists, artists, musicians, community leaders, tribes members, to enrich their experience in the park so that um, not only are th is their experience um, uh, wide ranging, um, but they get the most out of their time in the park. And hopefully we find some of that in their work propagating throughout the world. Um, we also wanted to mention, if your phone is on, please silence it. Uh, we'd really appreciate that. And um, I'm going to introduce our speakers and then get off the stage for everybody. Um, we have Michelle Oka Donner with, her, with us, a very special friend of ARI. Uh, we really appreciate her here. She is an internationally renowned artist uh, whose breadth of work encompasses sculpture, design objects, furniture, jewelry, public art, and video installation. Thank you so much. Robert Chambers, who um, is a Miami-based and Miami-born artist, represented locally by Tyler Emerson, uh, Emerson Dorsch Gallery. Thank you. Uh, his current show, Sarah Noah Repens, is up at the Airy Nest Gallery, and we just published our very first Airy catalog that we have available for purchase. You can get in touch with me or check out our website later today to purchase. Uh, we also have Deborah Mitchell, our creative director here, amazing leader of ARI. Uh, Renee Morales, a longtime curator here at PEM, who's organized not only 
50 plus, probably hundreds of exhibitions by now, but is also a major contributor to publications you'll find here at the Pam shop. And Dr. Hilary Swain, she's the executive director of Arch Bold Biological Station, an amazing ecological resource for us here in Florida, about two and a half hours north of here at the headwaters of the Everglades system. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Deborah, and uh, if we could give him a, a great applause too. Thank you, Sarah. Can you hear me well? Welcome. We are just delighted to have you here today. Do I see in the back someone from the Everglades National Park that arrived? I thought so. Raise your hand. Is that Alan Scott? Please give him a round of applause. Thank you for coming all the way up today, Alan. Alan is a really special, um, a very important component with Ari because he was there since the very beginning in 2001. Uh, founder Donna Markser started the program um, in conjunction and with Alan's support. And I do believe you were around the table when so many of those early applications were coming in. Is that right? We're so glad you're here today. Thank you. Well, as Sarah mentioned, we're here really to celebrate and hear more about Sarah Noah Reppin's Robert Chambers' new work in the Airy Ness Gallery, for which he did focus uh, all the way the headwaters of the Everglades National Park and well beyond um, up near Archbold Biological Station. The presentation today will sort of go like this. Essentially, we're gonna open with why the Everglades are so important and how artists' residencies add value to our communities. Renee will share some environmentally-based works here, and then our special guest, Michelle, will offer thoughts on her extensive experience working with natural forms. Next, we're gonna hear from Hillary about the research being done at Archbold, and then we're gonna close out the hour with conversation about how science has informed Robert's work, specifically the, uh, with this exhibition, and uh, we'll get to ask a lot of questions there towards the end. So one in three Floridians receive their water from the Everglades. Uh, that's fed from rainwall, rainfall and water sources in the north and central regions of Florida. Of course, it's affected by the economics and recreational activity as it relates to tourism and then ranching and agriculture also play roles in the quality and quantity of water that flows southwards. Critical habitats in question host endangered species, wetlands, and cultural resources which need protection. Governor DeSantis has announced $2.5 billion in support for Everglades restoration, but this still needs to go through many channels in our state government. In the past, the watershed clearly flowed southward through the river of grass ending in Florida Bay. Devastating hurricanes in the 1920s prompted politicians to build a series of canals and the Lake Okeechobee Dyke to better manage the flow of water. The result has been catastrophic for the ecosystem and very damaging to indigenous cultures residing in the areas. Numerous agencies and nonprofits have rallied around the science supporting restoration, but the remaining work to be done still needs more public support. And we feel that using the cultural arts to increase awareness for these critical issues is effective. For example, this slide is courtesy of the Everglades Foundation who partners with us on select projects. We'd like to thank them for loaning it to us. Residencies are important because they offer unrestricted time for artists to experience full immersion in a concept. At Airy, a sense of stewardship is nurtured, which is translated to our community programs, such as Sundays in the Park, seen here with Harumi Abe, Dale Andre, and Christina Peterson in the lower right for you. That lower right corner was from uh, the Unavoidable Twilight. It was an outreach program we offered last winter with Christina, who really acts as quite a phenomenal cultural producer in South Florida. Christina, will you raise your hand, show everybody? Thank you. We're gonna see a little bit more of Christina's work later in the presentation with Renee. Her work is also in the museum here. So building upon this model, partnerships have been formed with like-minded organizations to augment the educational aspect of understanding the relationship that various cultures and scientists have with the Everglades. Last year, we started formalizing the dialogue with an annual think tank excursion, which is an effective way to gather 
together in the very place we're trying to save and broaden our circle of influence. Sometimes there are unexpected but welcome results, such as this inclusion in the magazine Science Insider from the Everglades Foundation this year. We also get to hear about the latest news on the battle of invasive species, seen here with biologist Skip Snow. And now is the fun part of the program. Who wants to guess what is in the python's belly? Do we have any guesses? A deer. That's right, Michelle. You've been reading. Well done. It's an airy fellow, in case you didn't hear that. Is Skip here today with us? Who's going to try to come by? Well, Skip is, is also an artist, and he recently completed a residency at the Deering Estate, where he collected thousands of plastics in the mangroves and repurposed them in his installations. Another way that residencies have been influential in my practice is uh, in 2007, I did the Artisan Residence Program in Big Cypress, which really was the springboard for my interest in the Everglades. So it was extremely pivotal in my own personal life. Recently, thanks to um, Ari letting me go for a month and the Miami-Dade uh, County, I was awarded a residency at the UCross Foundation, which was really amazing on two levels. I got to compare how we were running Ari with how they run UCross and came back with a whole page of ways we could improve our residency. So that was very pivotal for us. Um, and additionally, I was in residence with nine other artists, multidisciplinary, and every night we had dinner together, and that experience to me was probably as informative as the whole Big Cypress Everglades experience. We would take road trips to the mountains, and uh, I, I'd, I'd go up with a composer friend of mine, Erilyn Wallen, and say, you know, when you see those uh, flocks of swifts and swallows, how do you hear that in music? And then all those conversations would continue at dinner. It was extremely formative. And the following is a just under two minute video I produced as a result of that time. So with that, I would like to, again, thank Pam and Renee for being with us tonight. And I'd, I'd like to hear more about the airy artists and, and extra artists working in the environmental arts that you have here at the museum. Great. Could I borrow that? Of course. Thanks. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, very happy to be here as a lifelong lover of the Everglades and as a big fan of the Airy program. Uh, with which I've been affiliated for a few years. Uh, I've participated on the selection committee and, uh, and a couple of the uh, think tanks. Um, but more than anything, I can't take much credit at all for all the great work that, or any credit that all the great work that you've all done down with this program. Um, more than anything, I've been a cheerleader, I think, for the last few years for this program. And um, even so, uh, 
this program, today's program, has given me the opportunity to think back on some of the ways that uh, the ARI program and PAM's exhibition program and collection have dovetailed uh, in spirit, if not necessarily in concrete, specific collaborations. Uh, so I just wanted to run through a few of those examples. Um, first, um, our collection holds several works by people who have been ARI fellows or people who have worked with the Everglades. Um, so Naomi Fisher is a good example. We have several photographs uh, in the collection by Naomi. Uh, who was a Miami-based artist? Uh, who was she a fellow, or is she she helped administer? Two thousand thirteen, I believe. She was a fellow, and also I believe she helped uh, administer the program at some point, right? She was somehow involved. I don't believe that is correct. Oh. <laughs> I thought she was because yeah, wrong. I thought she was um, also helping uh, with a program, like Christie, who we'll talk about uh, in a moment. Um, but uh, one of my first projects that I did when I first started with the institution here. <clears throat> was a, a new uh, project, a commissioned work uh, by, with Mark Dion, uh, who's a very well-known artist who works with environmental themes. And um, he did a project that involves, um, essentially the topic of the project was uh, the history of gathering from the Everglades. Starting, uh, it was a three-part project. Uh, it started with contemporary times. Uh, which are represented by uh, this large uh, mobile laboratory, uh, which was um, part of the South Florida Wildlife Rescue Unit, which is this fictional uh, governmental agency. Uh, it was almost like a, um, a wish fulfillment kind of thing. Like this is the kind of agency that we want to see happening. Uh, going, that, that would swoop into the Everglades and rescue plants and animals. And uh, I mean, there are agencies and um, folks who do this. Uh, in many ways, this was kind of a sort of a way of symbolizing those efforts, complete with a logo and everything. Um, and um, uh, another part of the project was this uh, vitrine filled with a herbarium that was ostensibly created by Henry Perrine, who was one of the first um, ex uh, first inhabitants of the Everglades, uh, from uh, Western inhabitants, um, who created a, what's called a herbarium, which is a, a book in which you press uh, plant specimens. Um, now, this is all fictional. This was created by Mark. Um, but um, this, it, it, so it's, it's in a way an artifact that speaks of, that, of, of Perrine's uh, history in the, in the area. So we were able to acquire all of this for, for the collection, which is uh, great. Um, <clears throat> and thanks in part to the generosity of uh, folks who are in this room. Um, we have this beautiful diptych of drawings um, by Christina Peterson. Um, on the left, yeah. On the left is uh, the top of a tree that is in the vicinity of the grave of Zora Neale Hurston. And on the right is the trunk of a beautiful majestic elm tree, is that right? Juniper tree, thank you. Um, that marks the grave of Eudora Welty. Uh, so here you have an African American writer and a white Southern writer uh, who have these very different grave sites. Uh, from what I understand, from what Christina was would tell me, uh, the grave, the grave site of Zora Neale Hurston is quite um, disheveled, and um, it's actually not even clear exactly where she's buried. It, it does, there's not a very um, clear marker, uh, which couldn't be more different from. Yeah. Say again. It was just her guessing where. Great. Um, whereas uh, Eudora Welty's grave was quite beautifully manicured and had this wonderful tree. So, um, interesting. And it's in Florida, by the way. It's uh, where somewhere. Fort Pierce. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, so this is a, an interesting artist who, uh, an interesting set of um, writers who have this uh, um, strange connection that's drawn by uh, Christina. Um, and uh, I was able to curate this work into um, an exhibition of our uh, collection um, uh, from a couple of years ago. Uh, now this is a work by Christy Gast. I'm sorry, I'm gonna try to run through all of this. Um, Christy Gast, uh, 
is a, an artist who lived here for many years. She recently moved to upstate New York. Um, but she she was involved in uh, carrying out the program. Exactly. Uh, so for Christy, for those of you who know her, was quite an, uh, a game changer for Ari. Because in 2009, uh, she wrote for our 501c3 status. So she's the reason Ari is able to apply for grants and, and have funding to bring programs like this to the public. It's a very big deal. And she volunteered tirelessly up to 40 hours a week as president during that era, so we owe a lot to her. Yeah. yeah and I became aware of the program through her and became involved through her. Um, and she's a great artist as well. And we have this piece, which I think is just wonderful in the collection, which uh, I've, I've included a couple of times in our galleries. Um, this is, uh, again, I'll try to be quick. Uh, so she was traveling through, um, I believe, Utah. Yeah, Utah and pretty much in a very remote area, kind of in the middle of nowhere. And she heard about a boat in a cave at the top of a mountain in this very, very arid desert, very, very far away from water, right? And um, the local folklore, the legend, was that there were these two men who would come together in this cave to build this boat in anticipation of what they thought was coming, a, a second biblical flood that would come and destroy civilization once again. Um, now, interestingly, right around that time, which would have been maybe the 50s, 60s in this area, um, there were efforts to reroute the water and to create dams and to flood some of this area. So some of this um, real, these real contemporary developments got somehow got merged into the minds of these uh, eccentric guys and became all wrapped up in this uh, folk legend. So it's a really fascinating story, which she tells in the form of pictograms in the central screen. You can see there two nails representing the two guys. And at one point she lays out a bunch of pieces of glass. These are all fragments that she found littered around the cave. So she tells the story in the form of pictures using these objects while singing. Um, it sounds like old timey kind of folk, country folk music. Um, and the lyrics of what she's singing tell, again, tell the story of these two men. And she had her voice lowered, so it sounds like a man's voice. And meanwhile, in the other two screens, you see flashes of the area, this really beautiful, uh, but very, very stark uh, and austere uh, landscape. So it's a brilliant piece, I think, called Batty Cave, which we were able to acquire uh, thanks to Rosa, Rosa de la Cruz. Um, and I've done a couple of jobs. How much time do I have left? Uh, one minute. One minute. Okay, well, I'll just run through very quickly a couple of other projects I've done which aren't necessarily um, related to Aerie, but uh, which are associated or um, related in terms of theme, in terms of um, concentration. This is a project that I worked on with an artist named Maria Tica Potrich, um, who's Slovenian originally. <coughs> and it was based on an experience that she had had several years before. She was traveling through Brazil and came across a program called the School of the Forest. The University of Sao Paulo had set up this program out really in the middle of nowhere in the Amazon uh, where um, they would create schools, uh, usually using these open air uh, elevated platform structures, uh, where they would bring uh, very well known scholars and thinkers from around the world, Bruno Latour, other very important people, out to this uh, place in the Amazon, also artists like Maritza, to exchange knowledge on equal terms with the forest people, the people who lived in the forest either as workers for uh, the rubber industry or whatever, or as people who uh, belonged to some of the tribes of that area. So what she did when we invited her to do a project here is that she recreated one of these platform structures in the gallery. And then we invited several of the folks who had participated in the original School of the Forest in Brazil to come to Miami and to hold workshops and do lectures. And in addition, a whole other set of thinkers and writers and scholars uh, to come and speak and have this very interactive, participatory uh, kind of experience right in the middle of the gallery. Um, and much of the discussions had to do with climate change. And um, in, in several cases, uh, we focused on uh, local issues, in particular the Everglades. <clears throat> um, and then 
I'm going to skip over Big Vanderpool. Um, well, no, I'll be very quick. <laughs> um, so this was a project uh, that related to the unofficial ban from a few years ago on the use of words like climate change, global warming in Florida state government documents. I don't know if you all remember this uh, controversy. Um, so the artists, uh, this Dutch duo, uh, were really struck by this. So um, I can talk about this afterward, but essentially this uh, project uh, in which we converted one of our galleries into an aviary for, for parrots um, uh, had to do with um, the connection between speech, human culture, the environment, environmental discretion, destruction, and the ways in which speech, uh, which has been used to distinguish ourselves from the natural world in this catast with, with catastrophic effects, uh, is now our only hope for ameliorating or helping to undo that kind of damage. It's a long story short. Um, but then lastly, I wanted to talk about, um, or just, just briefly, I'll let Robert talk about it, but we have several works by Robert in the collection, and um, a couple of, was it two years ago, 2016? I can't see anymore. Um, yes. Um, so I'll, I'll let Robert talk about this work, but this is one of several works that we have in the collection. Um, and um, a couple of years ago, we did a project uh, with Michelle Cadoner, which I wasn't the curator, but it was a beautiful show. I hope you all had a chance to see it. And on that note, I will... Um, pass the mic and let uh, Michelle or Robert uh, take over. Um. Michelle, yes, we'd love to hear from you. And thank you again for joining us today. Although Michelle is not an Aerie Fellow, we became friends a couple of years ago online um, it, through a most unusual source. Someone connected us to, to read each other's books, essentially. And since then, we've just been online buddies. And I'm just so flattered that she would come down from New York and join us this weekend, so thank you. I'm sure most of you know her from her incredible work in Miami International Airport. I believe that was an Art in Public Places venture, was it? Why don't you tell us about it? Well, first of all, I'm so happy to hear Zora Neale Hurston's name, another daughter of Florida. Even though I came down from New York, I was born and raised here. And um, when I think about it, the city of Miami Beach was only 30 years old when I was born, which is pretty extraordinary because as I walked it this morning, I remembered empty lots and you know all kinds of wildness. And it was in the 50s that when television came, they had Tarzan, and we thought we could go out and swing on the vines, and we did. So the beginning of Zora's autobiography, Dust Tracks on the Road, she says, I have memories within that came out of the materials that went to make me. Time and place have had their say. And when I read that, so that's another person I was drawn to through a book. You know, uh, I felt the same way about growing up here. Uh, my mother, who was a New Yorker, wouldn't get near the Everglades filled with alligators, but the Girl Scouts took me and the Brownies, and we went out and made field trips often to MacArthur Dairy, Girl Scouts. Uh, we got birding badges. So I was raised to pay attention, to look, to see. Um, it was just a remarkable time. And we could go on the Tamiami Trail, and the uh, natives, I don't, they, we called them Seminole Indians. I don't think they're called that today. You could see them sewing with the um, singer sewing machines. The cheekies lined the road. It was, it was so close and so visceral and so wonderful. And there were a lot more birds than there are today. So even though I left Miami Beach in 1963 to pursue an education, uh, we had one institution here of of um, higher learning, the University of Miami. We had one art museum called the Low Gallery. It was a, a town that was wonderful in most ways, but had no interest in building educational and cultural institutions. So 
I went to Ann Arbor, Michigan, and spent quite a bit of time in Detroit, where I saw, you know, great museum, a mini metropolitan. But I brought with me something very special, which was the language I had learned here of, of, of um, unwritten, what you see before you speak. You see leaves, you understand, you have veins in hands, you have veins in leaves, you see flowers that weren't open the day before. You take in, in some special way, the wonders of nature, the mystery, the spiritual nature, and you take it in with all of your senses, too. In the 50s, they let the Everglades burn. And the, as a child, you couldn't understand it. You, you didn't know whether to be fearful or just awed or both. The same, we had a great hurricane in 1951. And, um, I remember where the big trees were in front of our house, there were holes. Looking back after uh, Hurricane Andrew in 92, I put it together that it must have been a tornado that lifted them out, a small, but we didn't know that. In fact, the wonderful, their eyes were watching God. What was so remarkable about that book on second reading is they didn't know it was coming and they couldn't imagine. So that brings me to today. Today, we know what's coming. We have, and with knowledge comes responsibility. So understanding the vulnerability of all that I grew up and loved, I return in many ways. I, in my practice, which has always been based on what I call the language of nature, uh, to works now um, that are really drawing from the, the, the visual world, the growing world here, but in a sense, they're speaking. So the airport is like a tone poem. It's musical, it has choreography. And when I started it in 1990, it's been a 30-year project. Uh, it just evolved. It didn't set out that way. I thought about Miami. What did people say when you say you're from Miami? Scarface, cocaine cowboys, Miami Vice, Morris Lapidus. Nobody saw what I saw. So it was my way of doing two things throwing a bouquet back to a place I loved and bringing forward to people who came what I love, putting it in a sense on a platter for all to see. So that is really the origin of the, okay. Was that Zora? <laughs> Have we conjured her? Zora, if anybody could be conjured, it would be Zora. So, um, and she actually, thinking about her, bringing her in again, she wrote in dialect, and, which I love, and I feel my work is also in dialect. It's, the, it's back to pre-language. So, let me see what else you have here. Into the yes. Mysterium Into slides. The mysterium. Please tell us about those. So, um, I, the first book that came out on, um, monograph was 2003, and the wonderful Massimo Vignelli designed it. But he had no patience for working drawings, and the publisher had no patience for working drawings. And um, working drawings are not that commercial, so I understood. So in a knee-jerk reaction, as soon as the book Natural Seduction came out, and Massimo said, seduction, seduction, you can't use this in a book title. I said, why not? I said, duction, do say, it's Italian, Latin. My mother was a Latin teacher. It means to teach. And so that's how I was able to use that title. Uh, I did a book called Workbook, Working Drawings. And I decided that the drawings should be 
um, everything should be named, that when something's named, and you know this as a biologist, then it, it's a, it has recognition. It's, so I spent a summer trying to look through everything in the airport floor, everything, and everything was where it came from. So then I thought, hmm, I want a marine biologist to be able to look at this book and say, artists know what they're doing, because I know most people think art still, you know, you throw paint on walls and get away with something. So I called the Rosenstiel School, and um, I was geared to or sent to a woman called Nancy Voss. And she was no nonsense. She's been there since 1951. And uh, she looked at it and she said, algae, algae, dear, it's singular, it's an alga. And then she went through, she fixed my book, it went into publication, but meanwhile, I said, I have to come back. Can I bring a camera? And she said, well, I suppose so, but it took me several years to come back to organize a week, and um, in a sense, my own residency there. And I rented a, a certain amount of interesting equipment, and we shot 400 pictures. So it's extraordinary. If you look at the one on the left, it looks like hands. And they're so mystical and magical. The issue today is, I call it the Mysterium. I had a show at the Logue which is University of Miami, since these are at the University of Miami. And um, they're in a very threatened place on Virginia Key. There's also 90,000 jars and a million specimens. So I went online and I saw that the, the seed bank the Norwegians have, is, is, which is wonderful, is this kind of resource, it's protected, and it's not even as vast. And then I spoke to a professor I know in Zurich who's, I think, the first professor of science and aesthetics. They hired her to, to put the art and science together. Her name is Ulrike Meyer Stump. She's fabulous. She said, no, Michelle, it's not a wet seed bank. It's what I was calling it. She said it's an ark. So I'm very engaged in rescuing the ark right now, and I'm very engaged in uh, working with um, the other forms I have ideas of where I want to take them. So this is what drew me not down from New York, but back to my roots, speaking of roots. So speaking of roots, oh here, now yeah, these are new, new work. pieces, yeah that um, they're photographed with my iPhone. No one has seen them really, but they're Miami 2050. And uh, there's a lot of architectural elements that have been saturated with water. So uh, they've been interesting to do. I, I just woke up one morning and said, I, I, had, I saw it, so I called the foundry and um, got busy making them. There's two and there's a third one on its way. But really what, what interests me more than making sculpture, so to speak, is really um, taking the arc, as I'll call it, the mysterium, and doing something like the University of London has done, where they have a collection of natural objects. They have artists once um, um, every other month. They have an artist or a scientist that have access. It's the Grant Museum. So I hope this is a direction that I can take the jars in before, you know, it's the clock is ticking. So I liked ha seeing the clock there, the symbol of time. And um, back to my roots, I have one on my left. Mm. So I'm going to pass the microphone to you. Thank you. Thank you. Especially uh, what what caught my attention, Michelle, was the way you described your relationship with Nancy. At, uh, on Key Biscayne, and, and I think that's incredibly valuable, as is the concept of why we're here today, pairing arts and scientists. And 
in that sense, I thought we could pass it over to Hillary now, who can talk a little bit about Archbold, the collections they have there, and, and what you all actually are doing up there in Venus, Florida. Welcome. Yeah, we're good to go. Uh, first of all, uh, my name is Hilary Swain, and I'm the director of Archbold Biological Station, which uh, Sarah said in the introduction is about two and a half hours north of here. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the relationship between scientists and artists from Archbold's perspective. Uh, Archbold's a nonprofit. We've been around for 75 years. Uh, we do research and conservation and education. And like many other scientists, we know that we have wonderful stories, but we need help telling them. We're uh, awfully good at writing uh, serious papers and uh, getting better. Uh, we take good photographs, but we are always in need of people who will translate things by the written word, by uh, different arts media, so that we can reach another public who are interested in our stories, but just don't appreciate them from a sort of the hard work factual perspective. So, you know, uh, the photograph on the left is um, of a wonderful gopher tortoise. And uh, it's on the top of a ridge, uh, which is at Archbold. This is an ancient ridge that runs through the middle of Florida. It's an ancient, dry, sandy ridge. It's a million years old. And Archbold lies astride it. And uh, that ridge is dry, sandy soils. And I'd like you all to think, uh, what do I see when I see that photo on the left as an ecologist? And what do uh, those with largely an arts background see when they see that? And I love the book. I don't know how many of you have read it by Daniel Kahn, The Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. And as an ecologist, I think very fast when I see a photo like that. It wouldn't matter if it was from Australia or South America or Israel. And I immediately look and I think, um, obviously, a dry, doughty environment, only shrubby type species, widely interspersed, probably low fertility, low nutrients, looks like it's fire driven. I, I'm driving by and I've already thought all of that, just the same way you thought about um, nature when you were a child, Michelle. I love how you described that. Um, for those of you in the audience, I suspect you're looking at that photo. We'll, we'll talk about the gopher tortoise later, but you're seeing very different things from me. You're seeing color. You're seeing saturated greens. You're seeing shape. You're seeing texture. You're seeing spacing. You're seeing drama. We're both seeing beauty in that scene, but we think very fast, very differently about that scene. And what's important um, when artists and scientists come together is the, what you do when you're thinking slowly. So as an ecologist, thinking slowly, I have to understand the life of that tortoise in the middle of that scene. And that takes decades of work because I happen to know that tortoise is the same age as me. She was first marked in 1967 when her estimated age was, I'm giving my age away, of course, <laughs> was about 11 or 12 years old. We have followed that tortoise for decades. We know the number of young which she's had. We know where she's moved. We know she is dependent on fire histories for that. Um, for, for um, She's dependent on natural fire regimes to maintain that low open habitat for her to have sufficient food to eat and sufficient space to put her underground burrows for nesting. So uh, we, we can do her genetics now. You know, science has completely changed in the same way that you can do your family genealogy. We can do this go for tortoise genealogy. We know which of the young individuals um, moving around are her, um, are her offspring. And we also know how many of her boyfriends have successfully um, impregnated her. And it's usually two to three for every clutch of 10 to 12. So um, she, um, oh, you're telling me to move on? No, oh. if you would like to do okay. so one on the right. Okay, well, maybe we'll go back okay. one. I'll, I'll finish this story quickly. Anyway, I have to think very slow to understand all of that. I think very fast to get the scene, but to get all those data, as a scientist, you have to think very slow, you have to collect the data, you have to test it, you have to sit in the labs. It takes decades of work thinking slowly. And that is also true for the artist. The artist who sees that scene has to think very slowly to interpret it. And it's that coming together of thinking slowly that is the real power of an art science collaboration. That is what Robert understood. He started to think slowly about shapes and figures and how to convey them to the public and combine that with the slow knowledge that we have. 
So I, I love the power of thinking fast and thinking slow in terms of a science collaboration. The other thing that scientists really struggle with, and this is another component of our work at Archbold, um, we manage 20,000 acres. Some of it is that ancient, dry, sandy habitat you saw in the first slide. Some of it is um, we also manage a 10,500 acre full-scale working cattle ranch. There are nearly a million acres of cattle ranches in the headwaters of the Everglades. Um, we have some of the largest ranches in terms of number of cows in the country here in the headwaters of the Everglades in Florida. One of the things we're always measuring on the ranch or on our lake, on the station which is called Lake Annie, is we spend a lot of time measuring things you can't see or feel or sense in any way. So um, on the top left, we're measuring fluxes of carbon dioxide and fluxes of methane. Critically important for understanding climate change and um, greenhouse gas exchanges. Critically important for us to understand how much plants are taking up via photosynthesis for carbon dioxide, how much methane is being released from cattle and also from wetland systems. As scientists, the only way we can measure that and experience it and see it is through instrumentation. That's a, an instrument called an eddy flux tower. Uh, on the right, top right, what's happening with nutrients? Clearly, nutrients downstream um, from the headwaters of the Everglades um, have implications for coastal systems and for the freshwater Everglades systems. Our job is to understand nutrient dynamics, and I'm talking about nitrogen and phosphorus in water. This is not something you can see. You can have a clear glass of water and have high nutrients in it and not necessarily see those nutrients. So one of the things that's very important for us as artists is how um, to work as, as scientists working with artists, how can you convey the message of the things that we cannot see or hear or feel? How can you convey those messages? Because we can publish as many papers as we want. How do we get over the emotional impact of the things that you cannot see or feel? Um, on the bottom of this is, I think, the airy group. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, it's the Agile Rascals. Up in January, yes. how wonderful. So the, the current um, area, wardies, I guess is the right word, who uh, were sitting at Lake Annie, and I'm telling them, or uh, sharing with them the stories of this wonderful lake, um, which has an incredible history. It goes back 40,000 years. The sediment in that lake on Archibald go back. You can measure the dates back 40,000 years ago. This is uh, through, you know, sort of pancake layer after pancake layer of sediment that has settled to the bottom of that lake. How do you convey that age um, other than just through scientific papers? Of course, um, artists see beauty in things. On the top left, um, I'm sure you're all thinking uh, pollinator and flower. As a scientist, of course, I see pollinator and flower. But I also see a flower that is up, up to every manipulative trick in the book to manipulate that bug to act as a pollinator. Flowers are not just uh, are not just beautiful. They are master manipulators of the insect world. And it is our job as scientists to understand that and also to convey to the artists of the world not just the beauty, but the sheer complexity of that system, the anatomical complexity, and also the fact that this is a little mint on the top left, a little mint called Calamintha. There are many other bugs that visit that flower to pollinate it. And those same bugs visit many other flowers. How do we convey that sheer complexity? It's, it's like a, a road network coming in with, you know, or a, a, an airport system with landing lights. Come in here, flash, flash, turn right, you know, leave, go to the next export. How do we convey that complexity? How can you help us? And I think Robert did a wonderful job thinking about the complexity of uh, pollinator and insect visitor networks when, uh, with his Sarah Penn's exhibit. Um, you mentioned that, you know, we sit here in a museum which, oh, you think of a herbarium as an ark. We like to think of not just the collections we collect, but the data we collect as a wonderful archive. I like to call it Archibald's wine cellar. You know, every year we're putting away wonderful vintages of data, vintages of sheets in our herbaria, in our insect collections. And those are there to inspire us today. 
when someone comes in 20 years time and they say, don't you have something we can rummage away in that wine cellar and find that wonderful vintage and pull it out again? It will always be valuable. It will always be maturing. And we'll never know in our wine cellar of data and specimens and information, we will never know what is the really valuable piece of information that will inform or inspire future generations. Um, so I wanted to um, end with uh, one last shot. Uh, and this is uh, of our working cattle ranch. So Archibald has a full scale, 3,000 head working cattle ranch. Of course, people always say, what are a bunch of ecologists doing running a work on cattle ranch? Well, it's an ecosystem. We need to understand it. We need to understand how nutrients work on it. We need to understand the wonderful sort of biodiversity out there. People think of cattle ranches as some kind of feedlot. They're not. We have hundreds of birds out there, hundreds of bird species out there, hundreds of plant species. How does a ranch function as an ecosystem? But we also want to tell the story of that land, tell the story of that way of life. And our data cannot do that alone. We are not able to con fully convey the relationship between people, the land, what they do there, rural prosperity, the economics of it. How do we convey that complexity? A little bit like, um, you know, one of the things I love about Zora Neale Hurston is deep in the uh, Florida State Museum archives are her tapes of communities in Florida in the, uh, as put when she did the early interviews in the WPA program, when she went into the turpentine camps and she talked to cowboys in Sebring in Highlands County. And uh, she alone was, of course, able to access those communities and um, have, uh, you know, have insights and access that most other writers were not able to do. So how can the modern artists and the modern writers help us as scientists tell the story of what is happening to our land in Florida? Because together that is a more powerful story than the data alone or the beauty alone. So thank you very much for having me be here. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Hilary. Thank you. With this next slide, um, we kind of bridge that, uh, that story of science over to the artists, getting over to Serapins and Robert's work, and the value of collections. Michelle mentioned working out at Key Biscayne to get some of her Mysterium work. And on the upper right side, you see something from the South Florida Collections Management Center, which is actually in the heart of Everglades National Park. Uh, all Airy Fellows have access to this collection of over 7 million items. Upper left is one of the pollinators that Robert used when he was making models for his sculpture. And that lower left piece is a woodcut by Molly Doctorow, who worked quite a bit at Archbold and was also an Airy Fellow and a Fellow of the program out in the Big Cypress National Preserve. So, in Serapins, Robert, get your microphone. Here we go, buddy. 15 minutes, come on. In Serapins, we decided to make a base camp installation that would really give the viewer an idea of the journey that Robert took to, to give birth to all of these pieces of, of art that he created as a result of our field trips and fun in the residency. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the main centerpiece, the root system? Oh, but don't you want me to start with that this was an extremely immersive experience where I was placed in a cabin in the Everglades for a month? <laughs> you can start however you want. That sounds great. And then I was wandering around in the woods after I've been told there's a large bear in the area. And I tripped <laughs> over I tripped over that root shape, that that unusual rhizomatic structure. And then oh, several weeks later, I ended up meeting Hillary at the Archbald Biological Station, where she pointed out that that object I had tripped over in the dark, leaving the area where the bear was, was a plant that could be 5,000 and up to 10,000 years old because of its clonal genets. These clonal genets come off the main plant that could be over 10,000 years old and spread out, causing ramets, clusters of other plants so they can be genetically connected. 
these rhizomatic shapes are architecturally shaped and it's a very unusual, inspiring object. So as a sculptor, I was really taken with it, but also being way out of my safe zone, I enlisted a number of people like Patricia Aguilar. I think she's here. Hey, Patty. Thank you, Patricia. <laughs> and uh, she had recently graduated from uh, FIU's uh, RDF and architecture program and is an independent architect freelancing too if you need a really amazing person to help you realize something. Uh, and I worked with um, Embus through their amazing lab. In the catalog, it thanks m almost only students, grads and undergrads and graduates. And But I did, I did get inspiration for a number of um, colleagues. Um. Before we move to the next <laughs> slide, can you yes. tell us how many days it took to print this piece, Clonal Phoenix? Uh, each uh, section, and there's uh, about 12 sections, mm -hmm. was, uh, three days to four days about. Mm -hmm. And one, partly through the project, I was wondering what I got myself into because it was taking so long. Literally at the opening, I came in as it was opening and with some <sighs> zap gap spray and Instalock glue locked on the last section and then the show opened. It was wonderful. A packed room. It was wonderful. I would love to move on to the pollinators table because I'm such a fan of this. This is a, a delightful surprise to everybody who walks in. Um, is this the one where you could say the bugs were enlarged about 200 times or is that for the berry? Some of them. Mm -hmm. And as an artist, there's a lot of stylization and interpretation. So we were looking also at like fractals, um, lytic limestone formations, the cosmos. We were looking at um, the tiny, tiny pollinators. There's over 300 insects that in turn connect with over 2,000 insects that pollinate thousands of plants in the Everglades and the surrounding parts of the southeastern United States ecology. And let's bring the audience back to the fact that in the opening video, there uh, were images of Dr. Mark Dayrup, who is an entomologist at Archbold, who was so helpful to Robert in understanding more about the pollinators, saying they were like the, uh, they'd stop at sapa meadows or Serenoa repens, like gas stations, right? They, they would be traveling along their highway and stop for some pollen. And they're repeat visitors. They tend to go to the same saw palmetto again and again, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. It, uh, it is like a, a gas station in the scrub. It has a prolific nectar production and it's very common. So um, Robert was quite right. More than 300 species visit saw palmettos. Not all as nectar, not, not all as nectar users, but it's just like, it's like, uh, well, I would call it Piccadilly Circus. I'm sure there's some New York equivalent. Um, <laughs> it's a beautiful <laughs> spray of flowers. Yeah. And massive. And um, I remember standing there with uh, Dustin Angel, one of your, what is his title? Education coordinator. Education coordinator. He said this was the gas station of Everglades. So he elaborated on that, how all like hundreds of animals and insects and um, unusual species come to this inflorescence. And, and they also feed on the berries. You know, it reminds me on December 2nd, there was a wonderful article in the New York Times Magazine on the collapsing uh, pollinators, I think it was called. If any of you want to refer to that, I found that to be a great resource. And uh, it kind of reminds me of the reason we put the map in the show that you see displayed. It's a vintage map from 1967 on loan from Gainesville from the University of Florida. That saw palmetto is not endangered. It is up and down the coast and even to North Carolina or so. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but with th this project, Robert's trying to w raise awareness for the many uses that it has had and trying to redirect where it could go. Is that right? Yes. The Serono repens plant used to exist uh, probably, what, 50% more than it is now throughout the dry regions of the scrub and also down below the southeastern United States. But it was wiped out in many areas. The Corps of Engineers de uh, declared that it was a uh, invasive. Mm -hmm. That's like calling the red mangrove an invasive. But it does block the way of progress for certain groups. So also the many canals that were chopped in diverted the 
water over where the dry areas were. And uh, I guess uh, Christy Gass and her work was talk, uh, talking about the diverting of the channels mm -hmm. and the canals and what that causes to the ecology. Mm -hmm. um, the plant is very unusual in that the berries have properties, many lost in time, that were used by many indigenous peoples. Um, they've proven that it is a type of vasodilator. And this, if they do continue, if they continue the research, they'll find ways of using this in medicine. Uh, the berries were used um, for everything you can think of, but it also has been exploited. In basically, any berry from any palmetto, it's called salt palmetto, and they sell it online, but not for what it's for. So it's been adulterated. So research needs to be continued. And also, I saw it replacing areas of sugarcane. Um, which I see in, in, as an invasive and bringing back these gas stations to the Everglades to help the ecology. Tell us about clonal ramets. Well, this piece was uh, the printouts of uh, Dr. Abe Abramson's work and Takadashi, Takahashi, Takahashi's work. <laughs> And so these uh, graphs were printed out almost like a visual braille to show you where are the genets or the plants coming off the original mother plant that could be up to 10,000 years old, according to Abe Abramson. We mentioned the catalog 5,000 years old, mm -hmm. which is hard to believe, but he pointed out since then, additional research says it could be up to 10,000, which is making it one of the oldest organisms around. So when they're shredding this plant, they're tearing up our, our redwoods mm -hmm. as well. Hillary, would you like to um, mention the, the length of Abe's research at Archbold? Is that over 30 years, something like that? Actually, it's over 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Warren Abrahamson, who is responsible for much of the understanding we have of the, uh, the plant aspects of uh, soil palmettos, uh, came to Archbold as a graduate student from Harvard in, um, in the 1970s. And he was actually working on blackberries, but he couldn't help get, he was just really interested in these palmettos. And uh, probably a bit like you, Robert, thought, how cool is this, you know? And, I thought, nobody's publishing on these, and they're very common, you know, they were, they were everywhere. And he started collecting data. And he came back every year uh, for the next 40 years. He's recently retired, he's still coming back. He, he was there last week. And every year he would measure, how much has this palmetto been growing? And he had little nails, and it would grow just over a centimeter a year, not very much every year, so slow growing. We have very low fertility soils. And he also mapped out an area about 40 meters by 40 meters, and he measured every individual. And he was just intrigued over the years. He published many, many papers. He was intrigued that it depended on fire, and he was intrigued that um, uh, uh, the, the slow nature of the growth and the fact that very few individuals came up from seed. This was a plant, and that it was uh, burnt regularly, could be burning every five to 20 years, and it would immediately re-sprout. So this was a plant that was in here for the long haul. And because he'd been coming for so many years, he was able to work out, okay, if it's growing a centimeter a year, and I have these long stems lying on the ground, if it's going from here to over there, and I measure divide by 1.2 centimeters, this must be at least as old as the arrival of Columbus. Um, and that was sort of what we thought for many years, that they were hundreds of years old bent based on the length of the stem. And it's not that any one tissue of plant is five to 10,000 years old. It's that what he then did is, along comes DNA technology. How fun is it? And we're able to clip one leaf from every one of this stem in the 40 meters by 40 meters and do the DNA on it, just like you could do the DNA on the genealogy of your family and say, that leaf over there on this stem, even though it's not physically connected, is the same as this leaf over here on this stem. They're, they're, they're the same individual. They're a clone of each other. They're just branched and branched and branched and branched. And he said, well, if I know that, then I could start to estimate the age because they must be, assuming they've grown at the same rate, one centimeter, just over one centimeter a year. The oldest individual way over here and over there, if I'm really fair and I say it started in the middle, it must be that length of time in age, i.e. 
that on average they were at least 5,000 years old in that plot. And the oldest individual was 10,000 years old. So the story is you sometimes never know what you should be treating with reverence in your backyard. I mean, we looked at an everyday plant that we all drove past up and down 95 or cleared for a you know subdivision or something. Without understanding, we were clearing one of the most ancient parts of Florida as we did that. So upon further research, maybe we can have a better idea of where we're going, right? Um, I put this slide in to, to pay homage to, again, the South Florida Collections Management Center, who loaned us some of those pollinator specimens. It's quite wonderful to go into the gallery and see something living. Uh, it's dead. Okay, so it was once alive alongside Robert's brilliant sculptures. Up in the uh, corner there, that's something from your herbarium at Archbold. And then this is what our little gallery looks like. We are so proud of this exhibit, Robert. Uh, why don't you give folks an idea of uh, what it was like to work with the 3D printing and, and then we can take some questions from the audience if you would like to talk to Robert about this or Michelle about their work. Well, bef um, leading up to the project, again, there was many inspirations before the spark happened when Hillary pointed out that the plant that I tripped on was the 10,000-year-old creature, which I saw as a sentient being. Um, I worked directly with EMBIS, the Miami Beach Urban Laboratories, or FIU, and colleagues like Dr. Orlando Yancinto Garcia, and uh, Jacek Kolosinski gave inspiring words, and through John Stewart, the director, uh, I was able to access the machines. It's, like, it's an unusual thinktorium, laboratorium there. It's amazing. And then through that group, I met with uh, Patricia, through Jackie, the uh, connector there, and then went to the RDF lab at Embis, I mean, uh, Miami-Dade South, I mean, FIU South campus, and then over to our own CARTA ACAS lab. So I worked with all these techs to produce it in three places. It sounds like you were actually taking a big risk because yeah. you're used to controlling your own large yeah. steel sculptures in a foundry, right? I didn't know what I got myself. <laughs> if uh, Patty wasn't there, I'd, this thing would be still printing somewhere. Oh, you did it, you did it, I'd you be, did yeah. it, yeah. But uh, it, it worked out perfectly and uh, Michelle was working with her Mysterium project, and we had spoken long before the project about her investigation. So I approached it in that manner, where I dove into something that I was I knew nothing about. So. I, I think that's such a great message uh, for artists and other people, other fields as well, is that ability to 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 know when to take risks, calculated, strategically well thought out risks are very important. I think, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and also maybe failure, a little bit of failure can go a long way. I think embracing our bumps along the road, it really, really helps these projects come to fruition, especially projects like this that really thought outside of the box. Yeah. Scientists are always failing. We fail all the time. We think of great experiments, we're so excited, and then we don't get a result, so we just have to try again. So I think that curiosity and then that constant failure before you get something interesting is actually really uncommon. You just got to keep persisting. Any questions from our panel for Robert or from the audience? The gentleman in the back there. Hey, Xavier. That's hey, hello, hey, welcome. Robert. One of the inspirations as well there was his Arctic work and whatnot. Thanks. <laughs> hey, so it's really clear how um, uh, science can inspire an artist. And it's really clear how the collaboration can have broader impacts to change society. I think the harder question is, how does an artist inspire a scientist hmm. to think differently and do differently? I think that one's for you, Hillary. <laughs> Well, the first way I'm inspired um, is that I'm inspired in the way that an artist can convey the facts that we've accumulated in a completely different way. So it's not necessarily inspiring my science, but I am completely inspired by how to communicate science. Um, uh, if you're asking me, 
have I thought of new science ideas or new hypotheses um, as I've been with an artist? I think, to be honest, no, not yet, but uh, I'm always open to that. And you never really know how those, um, actually, when uh, Robert sh shows that very sort of angular, pyramidal kind of nature of the stem, it, it does make me think about, well, what are some of the other, stru I, I did wonder about what is the structural function of that. I know a lot of it's just fire resistance and all of the packing and things, but sometimes it does make you look at something in a different way. I'm, so I'm probably not being inspiring enough here. Just the seller that you have, right, with all that data, like tons of data over decades worth of work, right. can be visualized differently that hopefully by you seeing the way that Robert would visualize that data, you might see some patterns or some different things that right. make you want to ask a question differently. Well, the, the first example, and I know you you, you know this, but um, our colleague on Lake Annie, um, yeah. Evelyn Geiser, who is um, a, a professor of biology at um, FIU, has studied uh, Lake Annie at Archibald for many years. And um, with her musical brain and her science brain, she was able to look at our long-term temperature from Lake Annie, which is, you know, this is us putting a um, you know, temperature sensor in once a month, going up and down and measuring what's happening to the temperature. And she was able to take those uh, wonderful temperature, long-term data, which are very important for us understanding the dynamics of the lake, you know, um, why, you know, light dynamics, um, all the biological dynamics, plankton dynamics. But she had that moment of, recognition where she looked at the temperature data going up and down and she looked at the top of the lake and the bottom of the lake and suddenly it stood out of her out at her on a page these are notes of music on a page and i can follow this over time and she has a wonderful ted talk it's called lake annie's song and it's uh, two years of temperature data from lake annie um uh, where she put it to it was um, performed by um uh, a, a quartet, uh, an FIU um, student-led orchestra, uh, student-led uh, quartet, who, which was really a wonderful uh, TED talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think she was, um, she's an exception in that she's a scientist with a deep um, musical skill who could put those two together. I think Mark Derup, who's our entomologist, <laughs> um, he lives in an artist science world in his head. Um, you know, many of his, um, I, I just went to the Miro exhibit up in the, up in New York last week and I suddenly looked at it and thought, gosh, those are just like Mark Derup's squiggles of bugs. It had the same kind of inspirational view and shape of the natural world. Um, so I think that some scientists are very, very um, amenable to artistic um, sort of viewpoints, and others struggle more. We just uh, we are we just struggle more. We do appreciate beauty. We we absolutely appreciate beauty, and we appreciate beauty with understanding, which is a very special place to be. Uh, but sometimes it is, I think it is a struggle for us to really learn learn from artists how to use that interpretation more in the work of our science. I'd actually be very curious to hear what you think. Yeah, oh, well, I worked at Hubbard Brook, which is another site like yours, and um, our water visualization data allowed uh, the, the researchers over there to, to see things they hadn't seen before uh, in uh, just looking and listening to our, our, our water cycle. So I think it happens. I just think it's it happened because I, my collaboration there was what you said earlier, slow. It's It's been five years that I go there every year. So I think working slowly, getting to know each other, understand each other, that's how it works. The lady in the center, yes. Irina. So I think it's funny we're talking about uh, climate change while this AC is blasting so hard. Um, I'm actually, anyways, I'm um, down here. I was like, uh, talking about environmental change, uh, I know many people use their approach of scaring or you know telling like terror stories of what's going to happen and i guess it's one of the major approaches 
And another one is education, which is like Robert's project. But um, do we know how much impact does it make? Uh, in, like environmental research and um, educating people on that, like does it actually make difference? So measurable results uh, would be the question? Yeah. The um, project is hopefully, uh, will, oh, the project hopefully will uh, set precedents like the Everglades Nest through Airy is a small gallery but it's at a visitor center where they got half a million visitors. I might be a little off on that. Uh, Most of them. Over 250,000 a year pass through. 250,000. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the, the project through this new medium, this new process, like what ceramics is to art and what uh, uh, casting and bronze and foundry work is to art, this work in the 3D printing area is a conduit to create... Um, ideas to inspire to a larger group, not just maybe a contemporary art group. So the group coming in to see the 3D printed objects, uh, the ecology surrounding the Saranoa Ripens will pick up on it faster. We also have QR codes and the uh, research surrounding the project within the space itself. So around the sculptural project uh, components, you have research papers by Dr. Warren Abramson and others. Mm -hmm. So it's to set, a, to set a standard or to set an example, hopefully that will lead to other places. Absolutely, we, we, we can't just sit by, we have to use our medium to do something. And that's, you bring up a great point about those articles is when you do go to the exhibit or even if you can't make it down to the Everglades National Park, on the area website, there are links to those articles which informed Robert's work um, by the wonderful scientists at Archbold, so please check those out. We can't, all of us can't just idly sit by and watch. We have to do our part, and that's different for all of us. Not everyone has the great talent of Michelle or Robert or the stellar biology staff of, of Archbold or the ability to reach so many people like you do here in PAM. But everybody has a role in, in the environment, whether it has to do with sea level rise or climate change, the emissions that are out of control. I think we can all do something, and that's part of the takeaway from today. I, I hope you understand we're, we're, we're trying to raise awareness. We realize that's not the be all end all, actually affecting policy change is necessary. Uh, we, we, we look to our friends at Audubon and the Everglades Foundation to, to help influence the politicians on that. Would we like to wrap it up with one more question or statement? Um, Sarah, have I forgotten anything? Applications are coming up. We open on April 1st, and uh, the cutoff date is June 1st for the 2020 ARI residencies. Um, I'd like to thank Sarah, so much for helping out. She's the new interim executive director at ARI. Let's give her a hand for that. Thank you. If you'd like to talk to Sarah after the program about a catalog, she has a beautiful one in her hand there. I'd also like to thank, to, to thank Valerie Grace Ricordi that I think had to leave for another event. She's our board president and works volunteers tireless, tirelessly to make sure our organization continues to, uh, to grow in a responsible way and uh, a very vital part of our team. So I'd like to thank our guests today. It was just wonderful to have you all. It meant so much to be here. Um, and of course, we couldn't do it without our sponsors. We got our first NEA grant for Robert's show. We're very, very proud of that. And sustainable funding uh, was recently achieved last year courtesy of the Knight Foundation, and as Sarah mentioned, Andy Warhol Foundation, so we thank them so very, very much. That is a wrap. We wish you a wonderful Saturday afternoon. Thank you.